Hello, my name is Bill Whitford and I'm the Life Science Strategic Solutions Leader for the Strategic Consulting Group at DPS. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about mRNA vaccines and just a little bit of an introduction and overview to what they are and how they're produced. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of the many new types of vaccines that exist to help define them. I'll talk a little bit about mRNA vaccines themselves, how they work, and how they're produced. And then I'll talk a bit about some of the new manufacturing developments that affect not only every aspect of biomanufacturing, but mRNA vaccine production as well. So on the right-hand side, we see examples of all the different types of vaccines that exist today. And I'll just define a few of them to show the context of what we're talking about. There are subunit vaccines that are actually a little piece of the pathogen, not the entire bacteria or virus, but a piece. And we develop an immune response to that particular section. There are conjugate vaccines where we take a piece of the pathogen and bind it to something larger to give a better response. There are prime boost systems where we use two different types of vaccines. We prime with one and then boost the response with a different type of vaccine. There are exosome display vaccines where we take an extracellular vesicle and put a subunit of the original pathogen on the surface of the exosome to give a better response. There are the mRNA nanoparticle vaccines, and we'll talk about more about one type of them today. And there are recombinant viral vector vaccines, where you take a non-pathogenic virus and you put on its surface the particular, for example, protein that you want an antigenic response to, so that the virus has a recombinant, a non-native piece on the exterior surface to help give a, a good response to that recombinant piece of the pathogen. So those were examples of all the different types of vaccines for anything. We'll talk a little bit now about the different types of vaccines we have for the SARS-CoV-2. There's a Sinovac biotech vaccine, and this uses an actual coronavirus that is inactivated, so it won't infect people, but will then develop an immune response to general areas of a coronavirus, not specific for the SARS-CoV-2, but for coronaviruses in general, and that's a pretty good approach. There's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine that I just introduced. In this case, uses adenovirus, and it's recombinant so that it has the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 on its exterior. So when you inoculate with that, you make an antigenic response to the actual spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. Then there's a Moderna vaccine that is an actual mRNA-based vaccine. And in this case, the mRNA to a spike protein is encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle for delivery and for protection of the RNA in storage. So how do these mRNA vaccines work in general? We start in this little cartoon down at the virus itself. We then make mRNA to, in this case, a spike protein of that virus, the exterior part of the virus that the body sees. We make an mRNA to that protein. We complex it with lipid nanoparticles. We get that vaccine, store it, deliver it. And when it's inoculated into, for example, if I receive this mRNA vaccine, the cells in my body receive from the lipid nanoparticle this mRNA. The mRNA codes for the spike protein. And in my cells, that spike protein is produced and displayed so that my body then has an antigenic response to the actual SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Although there was no virus or no protein given, the cells in my body actually make the vaccine itself, the active part of that vaccine. So that was how the vaccine works particularly. Now we're going to give a little overview on how we make the vaccine. So we start with a frozen stock of bacteria that contain a DNA plasmid that code for, in this case, the spike protein. So we thaw it out and grow up these bacteria in a fermenter, and they make a lot of these little DNA rings, these plasmids, that code for the mRNA. But we lyse the bacteria and purify those plasmids, filter them in a little purification, and then we have DNA that codes for the RNA that codes for the spike protein. So we make this RNA from the plasmid, we do some chemical processing, cap it, polyadenylate it. These are chemical activities that make the RNA more stable and more active. We then process that RNA by changing the buffer and concentrating it and purifying it a bit. And then we produce the lipid nanoparticles. It's kind of a lipid emulsion. And then mix the RNA with these lipid particles, complex them, get the RNA within the particle, clean it up a bit, filter it, check to make sure that it's a good batch of vaccine. 
bottle it up, and then usually that stored, frozen, often drug substance is shipped to another location for final fill finish and making the actual vaccine doses that we receive. So now I'm going to talk a bit about some of the general improvements in biomanufacturing that do apply to this mRNA manufacturing. We call these like next-gen manufacturing or the factory of the future or smart bioprocessing. And I've kind of put them into four categories of improvements. One is the concept of a factory in a box. And one of these technologies that contribute to the factory in a box approach are the modular and podular designs for facilities. And here we have prefabricated suites that are delivered to the final build location and assembled in the final facility. There are many advantages to prefabricated design, including the fact that experts are making each suite and you don't have to rely on local labor that may have to be trained specifically. Another aspect of this factory of the future is continuous processing. And there are many, as you can see in this list, there are many aspects of continuous processing. There's partial and complete. And one concept involved in continuous processing is straight through processing. You may have seen the video of how biscuits or cookies are made nowadays, where the flour and sugar come in one end of the plant, and there's a long a straight plant where the dough is formulated. It goes into a continuous oven, conveyor belts going through the oven, then through continuous coolers. And this is all moving in my mind from left to right. They go through the chillers, they get boxed and assembled in pallets, and then trucks take off from the other side of the facility loaded with completed product. We're doing the same thing with small molecule drugs and now in biomanufacturing. Then there's the concept of Biofarm 4.0 or the digitalization of manufacturing, and there are many improvements that uh, we're more advanced in, for example, rockets to space or uh, lorries taking, trucks taking product across continents. But we're applying it now more towards biopharmaceuticals, including vaccines. And this in includes things like cloud technology for data storage and transmission, artificial intelligence, this is applied to, for example, modeling in the manufacturing plant. The industrial internet of things where we have the equipment and the systems in a manufacturing plant all connected so they communicate and control and report to each other. And then there's the final category of these improvements in this smart bioprocessing, intensified biomanufacturing. And this is where we want to produce more product per time or footprint or volume, in some way increase the productivity of the system to make more product per any particular unit of measurement. My example here is cell-specific productivity. And in the mRNA vaccine world that I just described, you could envision, for example, when we thaw these frozen bacterial cells with the DNA plasmids, if you could make twice as many plasmids per cell, that is, get the cell to be more efficient in making these DNA plasmids, you could make more DNA plasmid intermediate per volume of fermenter. So cell-specific productivity is one way of intensifying the biomanufacturing process.